Hello, friends. Welcome to the Well Mind Podcast, a space for meaningful conversations on a broad range of wellness related topics. I'm your host, Dr. Ben Coles. I've got another special episode for you. I had the opportunity to hold a live podcast event here at Bethany Lutheran College. My colleagues from the counseling department, Drs. Karina Clennon and Helena Stevens, joined me for a live panel discussion one evening in February. Now, I actually did something like this when the podcast first started. I held a live podcast event through Zoom in kind of a webinar format back in the spring of 2021. Episode 15, College Student Mental Health, is still available on the platform, or you can pop over to YouTube and go on the Bethany Lutheran College channel, and you'll be able to find that podcast there. Uh, There's a video recording of it, and then, of course, it's audio on the podcast platform. So this time around, I really wanted to do something where students could attend in person. I wanted to do something live with Uh, people in the room. So we still wanted to capture the audio, so we did that, and I'm going to be able to share that with you today. And I'm really excited for this because I think it's in line with my goal to provide both tools for the well mind, those kind of mini episodes that I talked about in uh, my intro and outro in episode 36, Um, I just want to be able to provide some real tangible, actionable things uh, to support your wellness, um, in addition to the great conversations that I get to have with guests on the platform. So I'd say this is a bit of a hybrid of those two because I really enjoyed my conversation with Helena and Karina. We had a a really nice time and discussed wellness from a variety of different perspectives, but we also got to dig into some specific tools and practices that can be supportive in a person's wellness journey. So we had a great time. Um, I've got a number of people to thank. So tune in to the outro where uh, I'll, I'll thank all of the contributors and collaborators with a special event. But I want to get into the episode. I hope that you find the discussion helpful, useful, meaningful in your own wellness journey. So here is episode 37, Tools for the Well Mind, with Drs. Karina Clennon, Helena Stevens, and me, Ben Coles. Thanks, guys. So, uh, yeah, yeah. We, um, yeah, so I'll, just a little bit of background uh, about this. I've been doing the Well Mind podcast uh, for about two years now. And uh, the intent is to just bring wellness-related topics into conversation. Uh, A lot of the podcasts that I've done are one-on-one, but there have been a few kind of special events like this one. Uh, If you go back to 2020, we did our first live uh, event, and that was just in the studio downstairs, but we had to live stream it because everything was virtual in 2020. But that was uh, all on college student mental health, same kind of set up a panel of uh, mental health counselors uh, for that one. And we just thought that was something good and beneficial and we wanted to bring it back. So we're happy to be here. Um, like uh, Emily said, I'm Dr. Coles. Uh, I'm the director for the grad program and one of the core faculty. And I have with me Dr. Stevens uh, and Dr. Clennon. They're both core faculty for us. I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit, but uh, just my background. Uh, I've been a mental health counselor for over 15 years. I still practice uh, and see clients and do supervision, but uh, my primary focus is on teaching now. Um, But I'm still really passionate about being able to provide good evidence-based care for people, and I kind of think the podcast is one of the ways that I can I can deliver some of that. So I'll turn it over, let Dr. Stevens do a little introduction of herself, and then Dr. Clennon. Hi, um, you're a tough act to follow. 
I don't have quite the credentials probably, but um, I'm Dr. Stevens. This is my first year here at Bethany, but I've been in the field of counseling for um, over a decade now, working in both schools and clinical mental health. My career started in early childhood education, and I've been um, a faculty and counselor ed programs now. This is my ninth year. Um, so my areas of expertise and passion are um, anxiety, depression, addiction, substance abuse treatment, and wellness is definitely a topic that comes up um, amongst all those diagnoses. Um, in presenting problems and I found especially working in inpatient rehabilitation that most of the clients had no literacy for wellness no um, repertoire for what wellness looked like but a desperate need of course for wellness um, in many areas of life so this um, has been a topic that I've been very passionate about not just as a a clinician, but also personally in um, seeing what wellness meant as a mom, as a full-time worker, um, taking care of other souls, what it means to take care of myself as well. So very excited to um, be here today and talk about something that we're all very passionate about. Awesome. Thanks. Dr. Clinton? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Clennon, and I serve as the Clinical Experiences Coordinator in addition to my role as faculty. And I am passionate about that because that serves my previous career in which I worked as a Assistant Director of a Career Development Center working with undergraduate students and helping them make connections between mental health, wellness, career, and where they wanted to go next. And so in my role now, I get to do that in a really focused way, working with the graduate students as they pursue their practicum and internship. And also, I teach the research and evaluation course, and so I get to partner with the library all the time in helping the students access those awesome databases and get excited about the research. So I'm happy to be here and contribute to the conversation on wellness. Cool. Thank you so much. So just uh, an overview of the format. We have a little handout here for you. Um, this is something called the indivisible self model. And kind of what I was referencing when I started, I wanted to, I want to provide evidence-based wellness practices, information that's really based in research, that's uh, proven over the test of time and in lots of different areas. That, that's really the foundation for anything that I'm going to be bringing uh, into a counseling setting or into an educational setting. So that model is just there for your reference and for our reference. If it's helpful as we're talking about wellness-related topics and ideas, awesome. If it's not, that's okay too. Um, it's just a handout there to, to help us focus on a few essential pieces. So uh, you see that there's also a microphone up there. So we're not live streaming this. We are recording the audio because my intent is to publish this on the podcast platform after we've recorded it. Uh, but we really want to engage with you guys. I mean, this is what we're here for is to, to hang out with you, talk about wellness uh, for an hour this evening. So I want to hear your thoughts and ideas and questions. And so that's why we have that microphone up there. Uh, you don't have to use your name or anything like that. We can maintain that anonymity. Um, so you don't have to worry about that in terms of being recorded. So. Uh, so that's just kind of the format. We're going to talk a little bit about three different areas of wellness that we um, like to think about or work in. Uh, and then we want to hear from you what questions you have, what thoughts you guys have about wellness. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion. We'll answer those questions as best we can. Sound good? Cool. All right. So uh, I'll start off in just when I think about wellness, one of the, the most important words to me uh, is ho holistic. I think of wellness being a holistic thing. So often we get kind of siloed in our wellness where maybe we go to the doctor and we talk about our physical wellness or we go to a counselor and we just talk about emotional wellness um, or we're, we're in a sport and we're focused on a specific aspect of our conditioning and, and physical wellness in that respect. But really, all of these things interconnect, our mind, our body, and then, of course, our spiritual life, too. Um, faith practices, faith beliefs, these kind of things really uh, are infused in and inform our wellness. So when I think about, like, this model, if I draw your attention to that little circle that says essential there, this essential meaning-making processes, 
um, in relation to life, self, and others. So I think it's really important that whatever experience we have, good, bad, or otherwise, that we construct some meaning around it. We give it purpose. And then also have purpose and meaning informing any actions that we take. And that, that really pertains to wellness too. So if I'm gonna be doing things for my wellness, that those are congruent with what I wanna strive toward, what my purpose is, what's meaningful to me, what's helpful to me. Um, I'm really grounding that in myself and, and what's important rather than um, saying, oh, well, this person over here says I should really be doing X, Y, or Z. And I'm going to try and do that, even if it's not something that I'm really passionate about or, or that I care about. Um, it might be good for me, but I'm probably not going to be able to sustain it if it's not really essential to who I am. So that's that connection in a way between identity and our wellness. Who we are really informs what we do to take care of ourselves. So that's something that I'm happy to talk more about and just wanted to introduce that concept to you guys tonight. Um, Dr. Clennon uh, has uh, a developmental perspective. You heard her kind of talking about working with college students on career planning and you know that's a that's an easy thing to conceptualize is like you develop your career over time but that also applies to wellness so I want to just turn things over to you for a little bit for you, so you can share some thoughts on a developmental perspective with wellness. Yeah, absolutely. So I will give an example of myself when I think about a developmental perspective on wellness. I think about if we can kind of like bring this visual to life for those that are listening to, there's lots of different components, lots of different buckets that we can fill. And there are times in our lives when it's easier, I think, to fill some of those buckets. And so I think about my life as an undergraduate student, it was really easy for me to feel fulfilled in the social aspect because it was built in. I was spending a lot more time with friends. I was living in the dorms. And so it was just easy. It was right at my fingertips. And now that I think about my life as a mom and working full time, the social aspect and the friends is something that I have to be really intentional with. It's the part that I don't have easy access to and I have to really think about how, when, how much energy, who am I going to be able to pour myself into. And so I think about the different pieces of our identity as not needing to be filled equally. I don't believe in the concept of balance and wellness. I don't think that's a, an aspiration any of us should really reach for. I think we need to think of what season of life are we in, or even just like what season of the year are we in, and what of those areas do we need to pour maybe more intentionality into. Awesome, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a follow-up on that, but I, I want to hear from Dr. Stevens first. Um, so wellness also doesn't happen in isolation. It's not just like this internal thing that we do or this very individual thing. There's always a context that our wellness is happening in. Um, and that's, I think, something that Dr. Stevens really would like to share some things about. Yeah, so I take a systems perspective in much of my work, um, and what that means for wellness is considering, if you're looking at this um, graphic here, our context in which we live in, our local, our community, our neighborhood, our family, institutional, our policies and our laws, our government, um, these are things that affect our well-being um, globally, not just global politics, but something I've really gotten into lately is eco-wellness and eco-anxiety and how the changing face of just the geographic world that we live in. Um, I'm a Southwest girl and I'm living up in the Midwest. Winter is hard for me. Um, I didn't realize how much the displacement affected me until one one day I realized I don't have mountains to look at anymore. I don't have an ocean in front of me. So um, equal wellness is a part of our global context too. And I think what's really important about taking a contextual um, and um, systems perspective is that wellness today has, um, like we have a grounding definition and a model that we use. 
but you will find a lot of different definitions and a lot of different models. And it will say, look like this, be like this, do like this. And as Dr. Coles is saying, there's a lot of opportunities you want to actualize with the thing that um, really fits with who you are and your identity. But the commercialism and the capitalism of our world says, do this, be this, and have this. That doesn't always fit for the system that we live in. Um, I'll give you a really quick specific example. I was working with at-risk um, youth back in Southern California, and I wanted them to replace um, substance use with wellness. And so I gave them the traditional, do this, do that, go out and play basketball, join a community center, join a rec club. And they were like, yeah, miss, that's cool, but we can't do that stuff. Like, we don't have that around us. It's easy for you to say that. This was about a decade ago. And that was super eye-opening for me um, to take a contextual perspective of what does wellness mean in the system in which we are living? How does, how does our political system affect our emotional and mental health? Um, Dr. Coles likes to run for fun. It's suspicious. Um, <laughs> Well, running is really good for wellness. Um, can you run in your community? Can you run year round? So we have a lot of, again, opportunities for wellness, but does it fit in the contextual system perspective or system that you are in? I hope that made sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we've kind of put some things out there in terms of holistic wellness, about kind of your essential self, your identity, who you are taking a developmental perspective, and then the systems and context perspective. So I want, as you guys are kind of rolling around some thoughts and questions, um, I'm just going to pose a couple of questions for us to discuss, and then I'll invite you guys to come on up to the microphone and, and share your thoughts or questions, okay? So first one, I said I had a follow-up for you, Dr. Clennon, on this developmental perspective. Um, obviously, you know, Bethany is primarily an undergraduate institution. And so what, what did you see, I guess, in your experience as some of the biggest like barriers or roadblocks for students at this developmental stage when it came to their wellness? What were those? Sure. So overarching themes for undergraduate students coming in, it was oftentimes those students that were three sport athletes in high school that come to college and are not participating to that level of physical activity and no longer have that built-in schedule and structure. They were so used to having every minute of their day essentially planned. And then when they got to college, they thought that they would love the freedom that they had and what they learn or some learn based on their personality type is that they do a lot better when they're busier. And so it takes a level of motivation, self-direction to really build that in. And so, you know, being in a sport is not just the physical activity. It is also thinking about the social and also their identity. So they had an identity as an athlete in high school, and now they're kind of wondering who they are. They're trying to figure out who they are, and all of this is going on while they're sometimes moving to a new state, moving in with a absolute stranger, and spending sometimes a significant amount of money on their textbooks and on their education. And so there's so much happening at once, and the level of expectation, I think, that especially high-achieving students have for themselves in terms of, I thought this was going to be easy, or I'm getting all A's in my class, like that part's good, but I'm lonely, or I notice that I'm continually having the same conflicts with my roommate or these different people. And so it's really hard, I think, as an undergraduate student, trying to think about who you are, find who you are, and at the same time, take care of yourself. And taking care of yourself means really different things for different people. But what I appreciate about this model is I can imagine in the conversations that I had with undergraduate students, I had to ask them questions about each of these areas. So like for social, I'd ask them, who do you have lunch with? I could gather a lot of data by how they responded to that question. Or what do you do 
to express yourself or vent or get that out there? Are you somebody that really likes music? Do you like creating something? And so really trying to bring in those different aspects. There's no right or wrong in how we do this. But that's typically what I would find working with with undergrad students. Yeah, yeah. I know that, I mean, that really resonates for me. Um, my kind of personal story, I was like that three season athlete in high school and uh and it's not that even that I was like proficient at all of them it was just this is what I did I loved athletics I loved being around my teammates um and then freshman year of college I did I did play football but then that was the last like team you know sport that I did like after that freshman year and I would say my second semester of my freshman year was the absolute like worst that I ever did um, in school um, and like just in my overall wellness like that was like a huge drop off because nobody prepared me for that and nobody talked about that that was just not even like that wasn't even a concept you know it was like oh okay well you're done football now just focus on school and work and you know those kind of things and it was just left this huge hole for me and it took a long time for me to figure that out that I I need sport I need athletics I need um, that that kind of challenge in my life because that's part of who I am it's just part of my identity and so that was an important way for me to express that mm -hmm. well I think you bring up a good thing in that it's almost like a letting go and a grieving and I know we're talking about sports because that seems to be like really tangible, but that can mean so many things. People that were really involved with their high school band or maybe something outside of high school. They loved their part-time job and now they're in a new place and they don't get to work at that animal shelter anymore or whatever that was that was filling them up. And so if I could help point that out, then I would ask them to pay it forward and ask them to talk to their roommates and other people about what's different this year. What are some things that, I mean, not to focus on the sad, but what are some things that maybe you have or are letting go of? And I think that identity as a sport or that identity is, sometimes it's like a, a child. Like, what does that mean to not be kid and what does this emerging adulthood mean and how am I doing that and so I think there's a letting go that's healthy and natural and oftentimes um, if we can bring it to the light it's a lot easier for us to address it either individually or with other people absolutely and because I think again during times of change and transition the stress goes up and our we feel like our resources maybe are going down so we're not great at problem solving then either um, and so just having friendships and relationships to be able to communicate about these things I, I think is another important takeaway there yeah so at any point you guys can come up to the microphone and and ask a question so I'll I'll just pause for a moment and see if somebody wants to come up. It's always hard being first. I know that. So Dr. Stevens, um, I have another kind of follow-up question for you about this kind of, you referenced eco-anxiety and uh, that's a interesting term. I don't think even, I don't know, five years ago or something, I don't think that would have even been, I don't know if that was in the vernacular or even in the research. I really didn't buy into it until I went to a conference presentation and I think I didn't really have any other choices at the time and it was like, okay. well, I'll go, I didn't buy <laughs> until no, I personalized it, with it. <laughs> okay, so there's some, per some personal stuff there, but I, yeah. I would say too, like as I look at um, research, uh, just about generational differences that our current, uh, youth and young adult generation that that actually has risen to like top five most like stress or anxiety producing issues so i wondered if you could just talk a little bit about that about, and about the impact on yeah, our youth yeah 
Our youth are so interesting. They're inspiring in many ways because um, when I think back to my my adolescence, did I ever think about any of this stuff, like eco-anxiety? No. Um, As an adult, I can tell you when I go back to my hometown, and so this is where I personalized with it, it looks nothing like the way it was when I grew up, which I think a lot of us could probably say a lot has changed. Um, the landscape is different. I'm from Southern California. It's all about commercial, commercial, commercial. Oh, there's land. Let's develop it. There's no such thing as like, let's preserve the beautiful land. It's, oh, let's build 1,500 houses everywhere. So um, that always bothered me. And as I'm sitting in this presentation um, and I'm learning about eco-anxiety, I'm I'm personalizing with it in the aspect of like, um, our home doesn't feel like home anymore. And, uh, I mean, our climate is going to change, like scientifically speaking, which is not my forte, you know, it's going to change. It's, it's just a matter of science, right? Uh, so the weather changes, the landscape changes, um, the visual changes, we change as Dr. Clinton is saying developmentally. And, um, I think giving visibility to the notion of that that causes us to have anxiety, it causes poor mental health, was really important. And so our youth now, they're, they're conscious consumers of the world around them because they've got, they're in the digital age. You know, we didn't have cell phones, thankfully, I think, when we were younger. So they're learning about this as it's happening in real time. I learn about it 10 years later. I learn about it after the fact. Um, and so... It's like if you give a mouse a cookie kind of thing. They're good. If you give a kid a cell phone, they're going to want to know. They're going to want to learn. And that it's their, how their brains are working. They want to know how the world works. They want to understand why are things happening the way that they are. And I think the, the beauty and the demise of that is as adults, we're still trying to figure that out. But we've got to pump out the news, right, for um, for media, for marketing. And so they think they're learning what's happening in real time, but I think we know we will continue to learn. But because we've given it to them and they want to know what's going on in their world around them, they're passionate. Think back to when you were in middle school, were you passionate about politics? I thought I was. I thought I knew everything that was going on with the political election because my history teacher made us do a project and I had newspapers. I didn't even have a computer at the time. So now they've got little computers in front of their faces all the time. Like It's a part of the developmental phase where they think they know a lot of things, which is why I love teenagers. They think they know. Um, They're still learning. And so we're just giving them so much information. It's not surprising why they're not only passionate about our equal wellness but also experiencing the mental health aspect of it too in terms of anxiety and depression and uh, fear there's a lot of fear media out there so um, it's interesting what they're going through developmentally versus what we went through but fascinating did yeah. I answer your question? Yeah, well, and you some... just brought up more questions for me. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, no, and, and there's so, so many different um, directions to go with that. Um, because I think, I mean, you're right in terms of social issues, political issues, environmental issues. Like for me, in my generation growing up um, in the 80s and 90s, like it was... Uh, delayed you know it was like what's you know what is my teacher gonna talk about in my classroom what uh, maybe I think the like the the most uh, like immediate source of information I think we got like Newsweek or something or like a kid's version of it and and then we'd read the articles in there but now it's I mean it's at, it's it yeah it's in real time things are happening and and information is being communicated so I just think the that obviously is a huge difference, and so that would rise that issue or the, those issues to a, a higher stress level for folks. Because then you think about what like what causes you guys stress, right? Is it if you if you have a hundred percent control over something and you can influence it, like and decide how what you're going to do with it, you can manage the stress with it. It's all the things that are like outside of your control that are just happening around you or in your environment, those are the things that are like really anxiety producing because there's this uh, recognition, like I don't, I don't have control over this, but this is affecting me. And, and, I, and I think the kids don't have a, I'm totally resonating with the 80s and the 90s that I'm thinking of my science class and we learned about the big earthquake in Japan that happened in 94 and this is like in like 98, 99. So we're always like five to 10 years post facto from the event and now we're, we're in real time. Um, and yeah, I, where you're like 
you could be seeing video Life footage streams. from somebody's right. cell phone of like the aftermath of the earthquake or yep. even during it. And, yeah. and I, like, like you said, there's this need for control that we all have. Um, and in the child's mind, you know, I'm thinking 13, 14 year old, they think they know a lot of things. Um, and they know probably more than we did when we were 13 and 14, cause they have access to it. And I had encyclopedias, like actual physical encyclopedias. Um, but there's so much of the world that they don't know. And so they're trying to make sense of these really big and sometimes horrific things and they want to process them and they want to make meaning and their brains are trying so hard to desperately do that. And that's where I'm like, even as adults, we're still figuring this out and we've got 20, 30 years on them, to, you know, age wise. And so, you know, the beauty, like they know, they know a lot and they can be engaged with a lot, but they also don't know a lot. And they're trying to engage with really, really hard concepts and constructs in life. And the media only shows a certain side sometimes. And that's their, that's their fuel of information. And it can be very biased. It can be very polarized. And then they're just very passionate on unriled little beans and they want to go change the world. And so it's like, it's very fascinating from a human development perspective. For sure. Emily, does the library have encyclopedias? You do. That's there are, amazing. <laughs> there are physical encyclopedias. <laughs> oh, okay, that's amazing. All right, all right, nostalgic. Okay, so so let let's like uh, fast forward a little bit. So now you know, like young adulthood, um, we, like in young adulthood, we can have more of a voice or more of an impact. And so, even though there are a lot of social, political, environmental things outside of our control. What do you see as um, like a pathway for wellness in like participating in that, like in a in a constructive way? Because you you know I get it. Like the the youth, like they really don't have a voice. I mean, they're more subject to this and formulating their opinions. But now, as young adults, like and Dr. Clennon, you can chime in on this too if you have thoughts. I'm just wondering, like, what does wellness in young adulthood look like? in these, yeah, these like charged kind of high, <laughs> potentially sure, high sure. conflict contexts. It's funny you ask that because I have a client that I'm working on this very same thing with. And so wellness for me um, cannot be singular individual. There's a collectivism and, and a humanism that goes into it, which by that default service at a certain level. And we all know giving to others is a positive thing for our mental health. It's a positive thing for our wellness. So, uh, we talk about civic duty and the aspect of what, what talents and skills do you have that you can use to give to others? What are your areas of passion? Um, because we can't solve it all. We can't fix it all. And we can't do it all. But there's probably one thing at least that we can do service related in an area um, for civic duty that we're passionate about. So um, this individual specifically is passionate about healthy eating. And so one of the constructive ideas we came up with was what if you created some sort of social medium where you're teaching kids how to create healthy meals? Because being on the front line is way too much anxiety inducing. Um, so we're honoring kind of like her spirit and what makes sense for her mental health, but honing in on the wellness side of giving to others an area of interest and passion and not overwhelming the process. So it's like pick that area that you're super passionate about, um, what honors kind of your, your mental health, your wellness, your spirit, and uh, how is there an aspect of giving to others? And that's kind of been our framework that we've been operating in. And I think that applies to um, anybody sitting in the room, anybody who's listening is there's always an opportunity to serve. We've all got gifts and talents that God has blessed us with. Um, what is an area in your community or your church that you can use that talent to bless others with while also like, you know, protecting your spirit. I think that's important too, to not overwhelm yourself. If you're not a leader and a spearheader, that's okay. There's a role for everyone in every aspect of service. Yeah. So I, in thinking about this indivisible self model, that's really the creative part, right? Where it, where I'm, I'm creating something that's, uh, both meaningful and purposeful, but that it's not just for me it this idea of service or giving to others um sometimes we think well <laughs> like wellness is about investing in me but you're you're kind of flipping that on its head with a statement of like well my wellness is really uh, i can contribute to that by 
serving others or contributing in a meaningful way. Yes, the, the collective mm -hmm. aspect of it. Um, individual wellness also, I guess I mean positional with this, needs to be community wellness too, yeah. serving others. Dr. Clinton, what thoughts do you have here? Yeah, I can echo so much of what Dr. Stevens said. I was thinking about the collective and those collective experiences and then how they impact us individually and then how we can have empathy for other people depending on their life situation that they were in. So for example, the COVID-19 pandemic is something that we've all experienced, we all are experiencing as a collective, but individually, how we've experienced it is oftentimes dependent on our identity at that time. And so I was working, turned tele, and then teaching my kids at home, right? And so I think about an undergraduate student, you were probably winding up your senior year of high school in the middle of a global pandemic when nobody knew what was going on. And that will forever be part of your identity. It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. And so I think about how you've experienced that is going to be different than someone six years younger than you or six years older than you. And so I think we just, the people that I respect the most are the people that are lifelong learners, don't have all the answers and are always trying to figure it out. That growth mindset, I think, is is a huge cornerstone of wellness, that there isn't a right answer. There's a striving for betterment, I guess, and that's really individual. And so um, thinking about the ways that we give to others and how that serves us, I think about love languages, if any of you have ever heard of that or thought of that. There's two sides of love languages. There's the way that we like to receive love and there's the way that we like to show love or demonstrate love. And oftentimes they're different. And so one of the ways that I like to show love is I'm a gift giver. And so for me, that oftentimes means I'm either, either like curating something that already exists and putting it together for someone else, or I'm creating something specific and unique for that person. And so it's like I'm getting poured into because I'm fulfilling my creative self and I'm getting filled up by giving that to the other person. And so I think when we talk about these different pieces of our identity, Think of it like a Venn diagram, like they're all intersected in different ways and not to the same level or to the same degree or to the same amount. And so before I can give to other people or um, kind of take on a new thing, like you were saying, Dr. Stevens, to protect your spirit, I have to get a pulse for where I'm at. And so that for a lot of people is the habit that takes some time to develop and that's reflection. So we kind of want to jump to the next thing, like how can I fix this, what can I do? <laughs> well, I would venture to say you can't do that until you have a pulse of where you are right now. And I think the idea of this model of these different areas, it kind of just gives us a framework to reflect and think right now, in this time, in this space, in 2023, where am I at? Which, which of these things am I getting really good at? Are my home base? And which of those things are more difficult for me that I want to put an effort into investing in? And maybe that is the essential, and maybe that's taking a stronger focus on my faith life and, and what that means. And maybe I can pair that with the physical. And so I'm going to listen to a really cool podcast about faith and wellness and books of the Bible while I go for a run. Like I think there's just lots of different ways that we can 
build on these things and integrate them so that they're unique to us in our wellness. Do we have a question from the audience? Don't be shy, friends. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't forget that. So I was just um, kind of following up on that. So if you're looking at the model and you're reflecting and you're saying, okay, I'm really good at these areas, but maybe I want to focus on these areas, what advice do you have about setting your expectations on how much you can handle filling into that and keeping your goals realistic? Or like, do you have any like small examples of like things that you can do, like the running and the listening to podcasts? Do you have examples for the other areas as well? So I, I'm a visual person. So I think Part of it is getting a pulse of like, which of these are really big and do I have a ton of examples in my life of how I do that? And so um, like the creativity, that's my home base. Like I don't need to try to do that. That's going to be my default. I'm going to do that to avoid maybe doing other things that I should be doing, right? And so maybe for me, I really have to hold accountability to the physical and that means like moving my body and setting, like you were asking about like a realistic expectation. I have a hard time setting realistic expectations if I'm not checking in with someone else. If I'm just in my own brain kind of spinning around of what I think should I should be able to accomplish in two weeks, I am an idealist and I'll give myself a really big task and then maybe I'll feel more defeated than good once those two weeks are up. And so for me, I found it really helpful to see what other people are doing and then take and tweak what they're doing to work for me. So if you have someone in your life that's really good at that. That's their home base. They're super disciplined. I love to learn what's working for them. How did they just get those shoes on? (laughs) How did they start? And then again, tweak their path and and give myself that kind of two-week benchmark. I'm going to do this for two weeks. It's not going to work. I'm going to tweak it and I'm going to adjust it. And then I'm going to do this kind of like chunks at a time. That, That helps me find things helps things to be a little bit more manageable. Um, I will add to that. I love all of that. Um, I love the home base concept of like knowing where your strengths are already. And I think what's also important, and it goes back to what you were saying about not seeking balance. um, I like the concept of wholeness uh, because wholeness for me looks different for Dr. Coles. It looks different for Dr. Clennon. And um, Doing, taking some time to reflect and meditate on what, if it's physical, for example, what is an aspect of physical wellness that you want to see yourself um, connecting more with? And what does it look like to start small? Because sometimes um, our ambitions are, they set us up for setbacks and reminding ourselves that it's not a big, grandiose thing that you do one time. Wellness is a habit. It's the intentional behavioral things you do every day. And so with that notion, we could not possibly do big things every single day. It's just not possible. But could you go for a walk? Could you meditate in the morning? Uh, So I'm in the physical aspect still. If it's um, social, can you call one person once a week? Can you make it um, a point to go to, to have coffee after church during Bible study, as opposed to going straight to your car? So I think, um, Again, using your strengths and then considering what is just one more deliberate thing I can do that really honors what's important to me that I could see myself consistently doing time after time. That's what I try to encourage clients to do is like, what makes you you? What makes you unique and creative and different? Um, Because again, there's a lot of media out there about wellness looks like all these things. And if we try to fit into someone else's model, we're not going to find congruency with ourselves. And that's, you know, inconsistent with what the model tells us to do. So knowing thyself and trying, you know, a small thing that's new, seeing how it feels. Does it stick after a couple of weeks? If not, what's another new thing that you can try? I think that helps with just building that momentum and that encouragement towards infusing more wellness in your day. Yeah, I love this. And I love how each of us are 
probably thinking about this a little bit differently because as I listen to you, I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. That's a really good idea. Um, because that's not where my mind went too, because <laughs> I, I love setting goals. Um, I love setting big, scary, ambitious goals um, that sometimes I don't achieve um, and kind of adopting that growth mindset as seeing every failure as just another opportunity to learn something or grow or develop in some way. So I think anytime we set a goal or we strive for something, like failure is just part of the equation that we can't be scared of that. We can't be, and sometimes people don't like the word failure because it's like, well, it's only a failure if you give up. And I'm like, well, no, I mean, if you do the thing and you don't achieve the thing that you went to do, like, I mean, that's a failure and that's okay. Like we can't be afraid of that word. So I guess when I'm thinking about uh, some specific tools and strategies and things that um, are going to contribute to sustaining our wellness, you know, I think on the one hand, we have to recognize what what's holding me back in this area. Um, and so if I think about it from like a mental health perspective, um, depression is something that really robs us of our energy, robs us of our motivation, robs us of our desire to even engage in things. And so I know that if I'm experiencing some low mood, um, if I'm facing depression, that part of that is, okay, I need to activate. I need to do incrementally small things to work back into a state where I can, like, I can do that. I, I did that. And then I recognize that I did that so that I can stack that. I can build on that. Now, on the other hand, if I'm experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety, and that's what's keeping me frozen, it's not about activating, I'm already activated, but it's channeling that and funneling that into something that's productive. Because anxiety just usually likes to have us spinning our wheels uh, in a circle. And so there's no forward movement. It's, we've all been stuck in the snow at some point, I'm sure. It's just laying down on the gas and not going anywhere. So if, if we can get some traction with things and we can funnel that energy from that stress and anxiety into something productive and and adaptive then yeah we've harnessed it i think about the one area that we haven't touched on but i think we touched on it by talking about all of the other ones is the coping and that one's difficult because it's less tangible in terms of examples and i think this is the one that is sneaky because sometimes it's those things that we do to cope that for a while are really good and healthy and positive and you know no right or wrong here. And then if we lean into those too much and too long, they can become maladaptive. And sometimes we need somebody else to help us see that. So for example, I'm an introvert and so I need some me time after a thing. And that's my home base, is to be alone. And so it is sneaky, especially from a faith perspective, because the devil loves it when we're alone. Like we're so much easier to hurt when we're not surrounded by other people. And so I, I know that at this point in my life, right? Like the beauty of hindsight and knowing myself better, the more reflection I'm able to do throughout the years, I've identified that about myself, that I need some alone time and I need to know who, how, and when I can reach out to and say, I'm coming over. <laughs> you don't have to talk to me, but I'm going to bring my laptop and I'm going to sit in the same room with you because it's not good for me to be by myself right now and I think about like drinking alcohol like there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol there's nothing wrong with having a glass of wine and decompressing and if you start to notice that that is the thing that you're going to every time something gets stressful and you're finding that you're consuming more and more to the extent that you're not even trying anything else that's when maybe it needs to be addressed. And that's, I think, when you go to somebody that you trust or someone who's, especially someone who's 
not also coping that way and check in about those things. So I think the coping one is, is good to really reflect on because I think about what am I avoiding and what is serving me and what is now a disservice to me and who I want to be. Any questions from the audience? I could pose a question about, like, you all are getting a liberal arts education. And if you know what that is, that's like intentionally your curriculum is making you <laughs> take courses in all of these things. And some people like that and some people don't. And so I'm just curious if anyone has ideas of classes that like they're taking that they love that are like filling them up even if it's not their major or even if it's not like what they want to do and maybe you could share that and someone else could learn from it. So sticking with the coping theme and thinking about um, how certain coping strategies start healthy, but over time uh, can become unhealthy, um, I think just about anything can fall into that. Um, I, so the comment has been made a couple of times about how I like to run and that is very true, I do, um, but it's always, uh, there are seasons of that for me. Um, so like, I think during COVID, I ran more that year than I had ever previously run. And I remember my dad making a comment to me saying, well, you're probably never gonna run that much again. Well, guess what? In 2021, I beat that. I ran even more miles that year than I had. Um, 2022, no, not as much. And that's okay. Um, I'm kind of in a low season right now with that, where it's like, I'm just not doing it as much. I still do engage in that activity, but I've turned my attention to other things too. So um, it's not so much trying to find a balance with it, but it's like, I, I think about it as like shifting energy. And so there are times in my life where this thing that I'm doing for, for my wellness or really for anything, it's taking up a lot of space. And that means I've got to shrink other things in my life. And then after a time, whatever that is, I have to shift and kind of shrink that thing that's been taking up a lot of space and redistribute that energy into something else. And so when I think about like being a student, like you're putting a lot of your energy and effort into a few very like big areas, your academics, um, any extracurriculars that you might be doing and relationships. Like that's just a, those are big buckets right now for you guys. Um, and so there, are, you just, it's okay. There might be times where you, you just don't have time to do a lot of these other things uh, don't stop doing them, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, um, I might go 10 days without a run, but I know on day 11, yeah, I just got to get out for a couple of miles or something. And that's okay. Like, I'm not judging myself for not having run those previous 10 days or only running a few miles on day 11. And so I'm just using that as like an example. And it really, I mean, fill in the blank where for running for you guys. Like, so a period of time passes and you're not doing something, that's okay. I'm going to segue that um, because we've said 
oh my gosh, you said something that spurred some thoughts. It was about depression and how it robs us. Um, depression does rob us of a lot of things. A it is a thief. Um, and we've also talked about the notion of change and how we change inevitably over time. And you probably hear this from clients too. The thing that I used to do that brought me joy is no longer bringing me joy. I just want to get back to the old way. I just want to be the person I was before. And when you've gone through complex mental health or even non-complex mental health changes, you change. If your mental health is changing, inevitably your spirit is um, either fighting, resisting, or going with it, right? And some of those changes can be met with openness, can be met with welc with a welcomed mindset as well, too. But what I really want to highlight is like um, it goes off of the running and how um, the season is different. And I can relate to that as an athlete where my whole identity was being an athlete. And when that was absent from my day to day, it was uh, it was a, like you talked about an empty space. It was a hard loss. There was grief. And so I found myself engaging more with athletics and my wellness going up. But in this new season, I'm actually feeling different about it and welcoming that change in and open, open-minded to what else can I fill in that space that will be new for me, new for creati creativity, new for coping. Um, and so what I want to give to the students is like, you're changing every year, every month sometimes, and that's okay. Um, fighting it sometimes is our default because we're so used to the old way and we have this kind of mental script for here's what I do that makes me feel good here's what I do that is good and it's not that those things aren't good anymore it's kind of um, taking a step back and realizing I've changed I've grown I'm different what else can I continue to put in my wellness space that is going to give me that fulfilling feeling if those old things aren't the thing anymore are either of you journalers so my, my thing about journaling is that as someone that has like a depressive tendency, sometimes journaling is like the worst thing that I can do because I don't want to be, I don't need to amplify those thoughts. Like I don't need to give voice to them. So I found journaling comes better if it's prompted than just a free flow. So if I do take some time to journal, I really have to remind myself that this doesn't have to be perfect. No one's going to read this. I have every right to throw it away as soon as I'm done. And so really take the rules out of it. Um, that's really helped me. You know how fast I talk? You know how my, my thoughts go? Imagine me trying to put that into like a journal. Talk to text? I don't know. Do they keep up with you? No. <laughs> no. No. Okay. It's terrible. So I just, it, it creates, it's good. It's cathartic when I do it. It has a good, powerful feeling. I'm just impatient with the process because I have so many thoughts very quickly and trying to get it all at once. It, I just get overwhelmed and anxious and like impatient with the process. But I believe in the power of it. And I ask my clients to do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm I'm like a hybrid. I don't I I don't journal in a formalized way. Um, but I think in a uh, for a purpose, for a, like a specific self reflective practice, I think it is helpful in that sense. As long as you bring intention into it. So some people just yeah need space to get their thoughts out. Hundred percent go ahead and do that um, but it's just I think helpful if we say okay I'm going to I'm like facing this thing or I'm I'm dealing with this thing or or something is happening like I just need to get my thoughts out about it and get it out so that I can start organizing it because I think that's the other tricky part is if we're, we're trying to think about our wellness and okay how can I improve my wellness you could spend lots and lots of time just circling that um, but until you get it down on paper or in a Google doc or whatever you like to use, like that's when you can start to organize it. That's when you can edit it. That's when you can highlight, okay, this is essential. This is important. This is something that I want to be intentional about. Um, and I think, so I think as a tool in that respect, it can be, uh, another step in this process of like identifying how you want to grow in your wellness. 
I've treated it like a question answer to myself. Like, I don't have to answer the question one way. It's like a bullet point of answers. And I know that one of the most difficult seasons of my life was when I graduated with a major that I loved that was really broad. And everyone told me that there's so many things that I can do with my major. But I wanted somebody to tell me what to do with my major. <laughs> and so I sat down and I asked myself, I said, what do you want? And I just kept on writing like all of the things that I wanted. And I didn't come up with an answer that day. Like I didn't say like, oh, it was sitting here all of the time. But I kept that piece of paper because it reminded me that I just had to start. And through that process, eventually, I was able to identify these are the things that I want and this is, these are the choices that I have access to right now with the information that I have to make some step forward on that. And I know that that was just a really powerful thing that worked for me. There's a... Um clinical exercise it's called the wellness card sort and basically what you see on this paper they're on flashcards, and it's got the um, wellness concept and then it's got the definition on the back and what we do with clients is we have them put the put them into three categories working really well so so not working at all and then we keep the not working pile and we do um, an exercise in which you identify you give it a number score like on a scale of zero to ten how would you score the level of functioning. And so usually these scores are between like zero and two because this is the not working pile. And then you say, what would you like to see? And 10 is unrealistic. If we're at a zero or a one, 10 is unrealistic. But let's say we want to shoot for a five. Well, what does five look like? What does that mean to you? Kind of how we've already talked about individualizing with it. And behaviorally, what can you do to get to that score? Because you'll decide what does a five look like? Here's what I do to get there. And then you take into account those contexts. For a lot of um, undergraduate students, money, finances is always going to be a big detriment it, taking five six, five, six classes, working, extracurriculars. There's a lot of contextual factors that definitely need to be addressed. And remembering it's for a season. It's not for the rest of your life. But um, that's a really tangible tool that I hope you all will consider is as you look at this, what's an area that you want to see yourself thriving in more? If you were to score it, what would you score it? What, what improvements do you want to see? And then what behaviorally can you do to see that score go up? Yeah. And so final, my final kind of thought on that. So I'm, I'm teaching uh, an ethics course uh, in our program right now. Um, and this might sound weird, but I have a wellness assignment in our ethics class. I think what does wellness and ethics have to do with each other? That's a big topic right up front. It's like for counselors, it really is an ethical mandate for us to take care of our wellness and, and attend to our wellness. If we're going to be helping other people in their wellness, we have to attend to ours. There's a new uh, series on Apple TV called Shrinking. It's got Harrison Ford in it. Has anybody seen any of it yet? Okay. Um, so the it's about a mental health counselor. He's the main character, and, and he's not doing well. He, um, he lost his wife in a car accident. Um, he's abusing alcohol and taking prescription drugs, and he's really in a rough spot. And he's still trying to be a counselor at the same time. So it was, I mean, it is, you know, TV. Uh, and I just was like, oh, well, this is fascinating. I don't, don't typically watch counselor or psychological things because I'm like, ah, I get enough of that already. But th it was just, it was really uh, a clear picture of why attending to wellness for counselors is so important. And, and I don't have them write out a step-by-step -step wellness plan. I don't have them, uh, you know, f fill out a five-page paper on the indivisible self model. I say... Send me a picture of something creative that you are going to make that represents how you're going to attend to your wellness this semester. And it's it, because it's so out of the box for how we normally think about wellness, I get just fantastic stuff, um, you know. And, I, yeah, so that that's just, I think, 
um, when, when we take the, the expectations off on like, this is what wellness should look like, or this is how I should be planning my wellness. And I just say, I'm just going to create something that represents me and me being well. I think that really opens the door for something. And then you say, don't shut on yourself. Yes, exactly. Low, lower, lower the stakes, not the standards. Like we want to strive for wellness. Absolutely. That's the standard. Um, but lower the stakes. It doesn't have to be perfect. And if it works for you, let it work for you. If it's externally influenced, that's incongruent with what wellness is about in that individual spiritual self. So if you like to run when it's negative degrees outside, you have fun with that. If you like... <laughs> If you like to just sit, and my best friend, she loves to do all the things. If we're going somewhere, she's got to do all the things. And I'm like, sister, I just want to sit. I just want to sit. And I just want to look because that's what feels good for me. And so combating the isolation and the introvertedness, remembering that social wellness is important. It's okay to do the thing that works for you, even if you're the only person doing it. And I think your example makes a lot of sense in terms of beyond the mandate to take care of ourselves for our profession. I think no matter what career you're pursuing, when you're not taking care of yourself, that's when people make the most detrimental decisions. And that's when unethical things that people never thought they would do happen. And so if you're sleep deprived and you're stressed and you're at like a level 30 out of 10 for anxiety and you are ready to apply to a job and interview, you're not in the best place for you to be in in order to like put that best foot forward. So I think there's just there's lots of rationale for taking care of yourself. Um, and one of them is just so that you can put your best self out there. Dr. Clennon, Dr. Stevens, thank you so much for sharing thank you. your time with the Well Mind, with our group here. Um, it was just fantastic getting to visit with you. I hope that these are things that are interesting and helpful and useful that you guys can take away. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, guys. Thank you. What a fun evening. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this episode of the WellMind podcast. I've got a number of people to thank for making this episode a reality. Uh, first of all, Emily Frank from the Bethany Memorial Library here on campus. She initiated this discussion, collaborated uh, with me on making it a reality and really helped execute the event uh, that evening that we held it. Naomi Redelick, thank you also to her. She's the site club president this year on Bethany's campus. She really helped with supporting uh, the promotion and advertising of the event. They had some really cool flyers uh, around campus, and it was just great to see the site club students uh, be a part of this event. And of course, got to thank my wonderful colleagues, Drs. Karina Clennon and Helena Stevens. Uh, I just had so much fun. Uh, getting to share the two of you uh, with the audience as well as our WellMind community. So thanks. Uh, I hope that the two of you will join me again uh, on the podcast. And if you enjoyed our conversation and this panel discussion, please check out previous episodes. Uh, as I noted in the intro, episode 15, College Student Mental Health is another one of these kind of panel discussions. I had a number of uh, mental health therapists uh, that were serving college students at that time uh, on the podcast. So that's, that's a great one. You can find that again on the platform or on YouTube at Bethany Lutheran College's channel. So if you uh, are interested in any of the topics that we discussed today, I did put a few links uh, to some handouts and and PDFs that we used, uh, as well as some resources and information on that indivisible self model. So check that out in the show notes uh, that, that's available for you. 
Many thanks to the staff here in the Bethany Lutheran College podcast studio. Alex, it was great having you on site and capturing the audio for this event. Appreciate all that you do with the editing and assembling of all of these episodes. All right, I think I covered it all. So thanks again for listening. And until next time, be well.